leave me two, three minutes at the end. Okay, okay. okay. Welcome back to the data track. Um, after a very, very interesting theory talk about data science products, I'm looking forward to introduce Valentina Georgievic, the Insights Delivery Manager, to talk about bu actually building data science products today. Enjoy the talk, and Anita, stage is yours. Valentina. Thank you very much. Okay, I will share my screen now. Hello, everyone from my side as well. Uh, I'm Valentina, um, and I'm coming from a company named Think Solver. And basically, uh, this is the content of today's presentation. So we're going to talk about the data product. So at first, I will give a forward. A forward. After that, uh, I'll discuss something about the data product. So I will get some introduction uh, about building data products. After that, I will uh, walk through uh, how we do that. And also, what are some of the biggest and most important lessons we learned within this process. So basically, it will be both educational for you and also interesting. So if uh, you will um, be working within some company building data products, or you will be the one in charge for building data products, I suppose that, and I really believe that this will be helpful for you. So to start uh, about the company that I work in, uh, basically Think Solver uh, was founded in 2015 in Belgrade, Serbia. And starting from this year, we are officially a member of ASECO Southeastern Europe. Uh, we have 38 employees currently, uh, basically data scientists, data engineers, uh, developers, so front-end developers, back-end developers, and DevOps engineers. And our mission is to extract, uh, extract actionable insights from the data to create the best data products and to bring value to the business. So what does, really, uh, what does this really mean? So practically, our area of expertise uh, includes building um, and deploying machine learning models, uh, data engine, uh, building data engineering pipelines, um, uh, creating, um, uh, so to say, decision uh, support system, um, applying the data management platform with data governance, data um, uh, management, uh, data integration, so practically data security, everything that has something to do with the data. Um, on the right side, you may see some of our, so uh, mostly banks and retail um, uh, clients. So A1 from Austria, uh, telecommunication company, Edico Bank, Banca Intesa, OTP Bank, Superkartica, Planeta, Gomex, these are the, the biggest retailers in Serbia. So practically, we have clients across several industries, telecommunication, banking and finance, retail, real estate, healthcare, recruiting and HR, and this list goes on and on. Something about our work and our technologies that we are using. So we are focusing on building end-to-end -end products that are, let's say, data-driven, that are business-oriented, that uh, are cutting-edge, uh, easy to integrate, and that are mainly open sourced, which uh, does not require huge capex. Uh, so on the other side, we are pretty competitive within the market. And uh, on the right side, you may see the technologies that we are using. So practically, we are building microservices, so Docker containers uh, running on Kubernetes. And for building uh, machine learning models, we are using the uh, 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 classical Python libraries for uh, machine learning like Scikit-learn, Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, uh, PyFlux, etc., etc. So uh, this is our key value, which means no bullshit, and this is practically uh, something that we really uh, uh, strive to. So we are really focusing on delivering the the value for the client, not just talking about machine learning and AI and data science, but really bringing the insights uh, and services to the clients that they really need. And practically most of our uh, use cases include proof of concept projects where we can really prove what we are doing. So practically um, uh, this is something that we are not afraid of and um, basically the, the way in which we are working. So to go to the things that we will be talking about today, which is building data products, the first thing that we need to clarify is this difference between the product and the solution, because there is a clear difference. At first, the Think Solver um, uh, was a solution-based 
um, company. So practically we're building custom-made solutions for our clients. And then with a uh, merging with a cycle, we, uh, let's say, uh, we are setting the focus on creating the product. So general purpose platform for our clients, which uh, can bring us um, the possibility to easily scale and to have uh, to, to be able to, uh, to serve uh, much more clients that we currently have. So practically, if we are talking about the difference between the product and the solution, so this here basically is a product. So uh, this, let's say, Swiss uh, screwdriver driver, um, uh, that can address multiple uh, needs, uh, uh, something that we call general purpose, that is a product. So we, it has several functionalities, and that is what the, the product as it is uh, that it covers. On the other side, this here is a solution. So it has a specific shape and a specific size, and it, doesn't, it does not mean that it will be suitable for uh, some general purpose uh, needs or uh, that can be easily, let's say, used for uh, different uh, purposes, but it, it is really focused and custom-made for a specific uh, problem and for the specific uh, business need. It cannot be easily scalable and also used for another purposes, so that is the problem. When we are talking about the products and services within IT, so practically some of the characteristics of the products are that the product has a unique name. So the service can also have a unique name, but in general, uh, products have a unique name. They have a defined, so standardized, limited feature set. They have a published price, uh, defined delivery model. They are repeatable. They have documentation, so pretty detailed documentation, a lot of competitors, and also defined dependencies. On the other side, for solutions, they are based on the standard product, but uh, they contain one or more significant customizations. They have some optional characteristics, Standard pricing, in general, they are much more expensive than the product. Um, they have a higher risk. Uh, they have uh, frequent changes to documentation. And um, basically, uh, they, they are custom made and you cannot easily apply some solution that you have implemented within one industry into another one. So it is pretty much uh, to, to make it general. Similar to this, there also is a difference between software products and data products. So at first we thought that we are building a software product, which on the other side uh, is not a real data product. So practically there is a slight but really significant difference. So if you are um, analyzing the literature and also some of the um, most famous uh, product managers, uh, they all define a software product um, as a combination of software routines, procedures, modules, or objects that provide some functionality or more functionalities. On the other side, the data product is, well, it can be all of that, but a data-centric product, uh, a data product is a data-centric product which primary objective is to use data to facilitate some end goal. So basically, data product is used within some decision-making and operational uh, processes uh, where the main purpose of that product is to provide insights. So not all, not all software products are used for that. And on the other side, data products are really focused on this um, um, uh, data and insights delivery. And here are some of the characteristics of the software product and data product. So software product, iterative, the exactness is there, the correctness, the a lot of programming and the clear outcome. So practically, if I want to see some web app with a, a specific type of graphs, having some specific colors, I know that I will have that as a result uh, process of the product delivery. On the other side, data product is iterative, but to the power of N. So there is a lot of uncertainty because of the data, because of the machine learning, a lot of approximation and uh, quite often the outcome is not known. So we are using some predictions and some approximations that should help us in our operational processes and our strategic processes. And you cannot say that the algorithm with, will always give some specific number or some specific input because uh, it, it depends on the inputs that, that it takes. 
And when we are talking about data products, let's, uh, let's say expand uh, this theoretical um, uh, analysis a little bit more. So there are a lot of uh, approaches on how you can and you should build data products. Uh, I came across this O'Reilly analysis where they are using something called the drivetrain approach for building their data products, where you have these four components as the most important pillars within this process of building data products. So as first, we are setting the objective. So this is the clearly defined outcome that should be achieved by using the data, the levers and the models. So for example, I want to have a prediction of the, let's say, sales within some retail um, retailer for the next one year, so for the next 12 months. So that is the objective. Levers, the inputs of the systems, uh, the, the inputs of the system that we can control, that can be pulled to influence the final outcome, including what we show to the users and also when. So, for example, uh, I can enter whether I want that forecast to be for six months, 12 months, uh, three years, uh, and also where I can control the data set that can be used um, or um, the metrics that I can use for model evaluation, etc. Uh, as the third uh, component, we have data itself. So the data that can be collected holding explicit as well as implicit information that uh, is useful for the modeling phase. So practically identifying all the data sources, whether for this uh, use case that I have mentioned of um, forecasting, we need the previous uh, sales and also some auxiliary data that can affect um, uh, the sales. The models are the predictive algorithms uh, that generate outputs that can be com combined for the final state of the objective. So practically, what, what is this, uh, identifying the set of models that can be used for solving this problem? So if we are referring to the forecast, whether uh, we will use some uh, traditional time series modeling approach or we will use something which is, let's say, more complex, uh, uh, less standardized like uh, let's say deep learning uh, methods. And uh, here, uh, since uh, I will share this presentation with the organizers and they can share this with you, you can find out more so you can read uh, more about this approach. This is something that um, uh, we are also implementing with th within uh, our company for building the product. So these four components, and there are a lot of others, but basically these are the four main things that you have to define in order to um, uh, uh, plan the roadmap and the execution of the roadmap uh, of building a data science product the proper way. But what does it really mean to productionalize data science? So what does that mean to build a data product? So uh, I also, um, in, in my, let's say, uh, research on how we can um, uh, boost this process of building data products. I came across a lot of different uh, articles and experiences from other um, uh, colleagues from the field. And I came across an article uh, which uh, had this uh, picture and, talk, uh, and uh, talked about the productionalizing data science. And basically, uh, I will use this analogy to also show you an example on how to do uh, data science, how to productionalize data science the right way and how not to do that. And basically, if we here have a Fonthill Castle in Dolstown in Pennsylvania, when you uh, take a look at, at this castle, it is quite uh, beautiful. So the yard is pretty uh, sharpened. Um, it looks quite nice. You would uh, like to, I don't know, uh, visit uh, this place and also to, to feel, to um, experience how, uh, how is it to, to live in, in something uh, like this and uh, also to run across this beautiful yard, etc. until you really uh, enter uh, this castle and see something like this, which is quite unexpected, right? So this is one of the rooms and I will use this analogy for also explaining how uh, pretty often the community, so the requirements from the clients can have um, a bad effect on what we should build and how we should deliver it. 
So let's say that we had a beautiful castle that really um, uh, looks quite well and that everybody would like to visit and to have. And uh, there it comes, the, uh, I don't know, the owner of the castle, and he says, I would like to create another bedroom. And you were like, okay, why do you need another bedroom? You have a lot of other bedrooms. And he says, but I would really need one uh, additional bedroom within this castle. Um, uh, if uh, I, know, I have some guests coming, etc., etc., I want to have a bedroom for them. And then you say, okay, but there are not, no more space left uh, within this castle to build a bedroom. Then he says, can we re repurpose some of the bedroom, uh, some of the rooms to become a bedroom? Then you say, okay, there is one storage room that we can translate into a bedroom. If we add a bed, and then you have a bedroom. And the owner says, okay, that's enough. And then you place the bed within this bedroom, uh, within this storage room, and you um, uh, obtain a bedroom. And then the owner says, Okay, this seems quite right, but uh, within this bedroom, I don't only need a bed, but also I need a closet. And then you say, but there is not much space for the closet. And he says, but I really need this. Otherwise, why did, why did you uh, build this bedroom at all? And then you say, okay, we can set a castle here. Uh, uh, the, the, let's, uh, excuse me, uh, set the closet here to cover the, the half of this window where, um, let's say, it is not quite right to set the closet over here, but that's the only place where you can set this closet in. And then you set the, this closet um, uh, covering the half of the window, but no worries. Uh, the most important thing is to have a closet in this bedroom. And then you, uh, the owner says, everything's fine, but I want to enter within this, uh, in this uh, bedroom uh, from uh, this um, hole, so from another uh, bedroom. And then you were like, but we cannot do that because um, the other bedroom is higher than uh, this one. And uh, he says, but I really need this. So you, you say, okay, we can do that. We can create a staircase here uh, that can be used from entering from this bedroom to the other one. And then the owner says, that's quite great, but uh, Sometimes within the night, when I want to go from one bedroom into another, I can fall down because uh, this uh, staircase is pretty narrow and um, uh, it can be pretty, let's say, uh, scary within the night. And then you say, well, there is something that we can build, uh, which is this wall over here that can be used um, as uh, something which can let's say, help you when you, within the night, want to walk from one bedroom to another and prevent you from falling down. And then at the end of this process, you get something like this. So uh, a pretty awful bedroom that it is a real bedroom, but it doesn't quite, quite have the, the right appearance. So it doesn't really fit into the image that you see here and that you should obtain but it is something like this. So it is pretty similar with building um, software products, but also data products. So the clients can really be uh, needy and specific within their requirements. And if you don't uh, know how to control this process and how to also implement and to satisfy all the requirements that the client has, you will have something like this, uh, where, uh, for example, um, another owner or someone who should use this room will not like it. So this is the, the, the main thing that you should think of when building data products. So how can we control this process to prevent something like this happening? So there are some of the main principles for building uh, great data products. So the first one, portability. So by using paradigms as packaging, containerization, workflows, to keep the code clean and prone to changes, which is really important if you want to have a product which is scalable and reliable. As another um, a principle, maintenance. So to use logging, alerting, testing, documentation in order to reduce bug pop-ups and to ease uh, bug fixing. So to make your future self proud of yourself. And you know what I say, the, the more time you spend on the maintenance, the less time you spend uh, on the real um, uh, 
maintenance that you have to um, uh, apply. So the more time spent on maintainability, the less you spend on the real maintenance. That's the same. As a third pr principle, scalability. So you should invest all of your efforts into implementation creativity for optimal resource management and efficient integrations to be, pre be prepared for almost anything and to also build trust. So by using the insightful interpretation and interactive visualizations to build trust in your product. So, uh, and to also in this process, not forget about the ethical principles um, that uh, your data products should rely on. So practically you are building some uh, models, predictive models. You should have um, a process on how you can evaluate these models and also build trust in them and to ensure that they are doing the right thing and they are doing, the, let's say they are functioning properly. So these four principles, um, they are quite general purpose, so they can be applied to software products as well, but this trust is pretty important in building data products because the users, the clients of the data product, they will really rely on the insights that, they, that, that you serve through this data product and they will use these insights into their decision-making processes and uh, operational processes. So it is really um, important to have outputs that you can really rely on, that you can really trust. And speaking of data products, there are two main things that we are offering uh, within data products. The first one is the functionalities of the data product. The second one is the interaction with that product. Regarding the functionalities, you can offer raw data, for example, as the main output. So you have data coming from various sources, you can merge them and serve them um, uh, through, uh, let's say, uh, one platform to have a single uh, source of truth. On the other side, you, have, you, can, you may have derived data. So you can use raw data in order to engineer some new feature or to transform um, a data in order to uh, enrich uh, the um, uh, information that you will obtain and then serve it through the data th uh, data platform uh, through some graphical interface or API. As a third functionality are the algorithms, so predictive models. So you can embed predictive models within your product in order to, uh, based on the data, extract some projections. Another part is this decision support functionality where you can create some uh, outputs and visualizations that can be used within decision-making processes. And as the fifth and the, let's say, most, most advanced one uh, is the automated decision-making functionality. So to have a completely independent platform that will combine the data, the projections from the predictive model, and some um, a specific set of actions to, uh, I don't know, implement some automated network healing in telecommunications or to perform some uh, automated marketing campaigns based on some uh, transitions uh, in the customer journey process uh, by using some in outputs from recommender systems or something third. As another part, you have interaction. So practically, how does the client interact with the product in order to get what he needs through APIs, through some, uh, let's say, static uh, dashboards and visualization, or through some web application? So practically, these are the three ways in which, in most cases, you can serve your data. This is something about uh, the introductory part. And here, I will now I will talk about our very first data product. So it's not quite... Uh, First, in everything that ThinkSolver has done so far, uh, we have built one product with one, with one of our partners, A1, which is Saura for telecommunication industry, but it is their IP. But this product that I will talk about is our IP, so practically our product that we are uh, developing. And here, um, uh, basically, we have divided our products into three main layers. So we have a platform layer within our product, which is practically underlying layer of the uh, Solver AI suite, which is the product um, uh, name. Uh, it contains the environmental setup and some core modules representing the foundation 
uh, based on which the whole product um, relies. So uh, it's the baseline uh, on which we are building our modules, so our packages. As a second layer, relying on this ba base platform layer, we have a module layer. So these are our product packages that we are offering. Profile Studio, Audience Studio, Campaign Studio, Forecast Studio, Anomaly Detection, etc. As the third layer, we have representation layers. So user interface for simple and unified on-click interaction with models, data, and experimental results. And basically, this is a more detailed overview of our products. Solver AI suite, we have Solver Atlas, which is this underlying foundation layer where we, uh, we are building this different set of packages that I will not uh, walk through right now. Uh, if you are interested in, to, interested in finding more, you can always send me a mail and um, then we can chat about our product as well. But practically, uh, we are building some modules um, offering uh, solutions to specific client needs. And basically, we have a set of machine learning models that uh, our product relies on. So we are building the commander engines, segmentation models, uh, customer lifetime value models, anomaly detection, forecast engine, process mining engine, uh, smart search and visual search engines. So practically uh, a lot of different things that are um, uh, used by uh, different clients in order to, let's say, um, offer insights for some specific business problem. And then if uh, some of our clients has e-commerce platform and, it, it, uh, and uh, the client requires some uh, advanced uh, search uh, within this e-commerce, then he will uh, only be interested in visual search or smart search. And in some cases for the commander engine. So he does not need, for example, process mining or anomaly detection. And that's the main power of the platform. So you can only take the uh, modules that you really need. And this is only a detailed overview of the platform. So practically all the, let's say, packages are based on microservices uh, where we have, so to say, black box, uh, taking some standardized inputs and providing some standardized outputs. And also these containers can talk with each other um, uh, and uh, offer um, uh, their outputs through the API to uh, some external systems or um, uh, to the graphical interface of our platform. Uh, the platform is able to, to be run on cloud and also on premise. So basically that's um, something about the, uh, the product. Which pro problems do we solve? Well, the problems of personalization, prioritization, the customer journey and satisfaction, operation efficiency, and insights-driven uh, strategic planning. So mostly it is used by sales and marketing teams and decision makers. So everybody whose daily job requires making decisions or taking actions based on data and insights obtained. So that is in short about the product itself. And now I want to also um, have a look at the uh, challenges that we encountered along, along the way. So you've probably seen that we have a lot of functionalities that we are offering to the clients and that is good. But on the other side, everything's, everything comes with uh, a specific price that we also had to pay uh, in order to, to get uh, to something that we have today. So as the first challenge, we had this transition or uh, let's say uh, uh, mindset, mindset reshaping from building data science models into building something which is a software, which is a product. And it was pretty hard because at the beginning, at the very beginning at ThinkSolver, we had more, mostly um, a lot of data scientists and a few data engineers and no developers. And imagine this setup, so we had not DevOps engineers as well. And we were like, okay, now we want to build products. And it was pretty hard because it required uh, data scientists to also focus on uh, data ops, uh, engineering pipelines, um, developing the application and the APIs. And it was really hard because data scientists, you know, data scientists, they want to perform some research or to uh, solve some specific 
uh, client need, but they, they don't really always like to think about uh, code uh, refactoring and vectorization or some, uh, let's say, development um, uh, patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So it was quite hard to make this transition and to also, um, uh, let's say, understand and to make our people do something that they are not supposed to do. And it was wrong from our side. So that is something that we have, let's say, uh, focused uh, on and solved within this growth process. So basically, uh, yes, we are building um, data science uh, product, but in, in, uh, in general, it is a product. So we really need to have development team and also data scientists that should somehow understand how the product development is going uh, on and what's the process and to, let's say, shape in within this process. And one of the things that were quite problematic was that we had this uh, sprint planning and sprint, sprint review sessions uh, where when we employed some of the developers, backend developers and frontend developers, they were like having these tasks. They were finishing every sprint. And on the other side, data scientists who performed some research where they couldn't really... Uh, provide some outputs in two weeks, which was the, let's say, the duration of the sprint. So it was quite depressing for them because they are performing some research. They don't quite know whether the results will be good, whether the model should require some additional tuning or the input should be enriched. So it was quite depressing to see uh, other developers like progressing and we data scientists uh, not really having something to declare because we are still in the phase of research or the model uh, does not have the required accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. So this was one of the first uh, challenges. Another challenge that we encountered was obtaining this roadmap, development roadmap that we have. Um, so the module development that we had and this uh, client requirements. So basically we are focusing on the roadmap. We have something that we wanted to develop. And then we had the clients coming and saying, but I really need this. It is quite important for me to have this functionality. And then we didn't know whether we should like follow the roadmap or implement this, what the client is requiring. So it was quite challenging to, um, uh, let's say, balance um, between these two. As a third challenge, we had this product focus versus delivery focus. So uh, we had the people uh, working within uh, services departments, within delivery department, and they were also working on building the product. And since uh, on the services part, we had clients paying for their services, requiring some, um, uh, let's say, dedication, and on the other side, we had a product which is not sold yet. So it is not earning money. So you're like, uh, should I focus on building the service for the client paying a lot of money or on the product which does not really earn the money yet? So what's, what's my priority over here? And the teams were always setting the priority on the current client, on the current service uh, and not on the product. And that is why the product uh, really had um, uh, let's say, um, uh, ups and downs within the development phase. So basically, uh, it, it couldn't quite grow and um, become stable because no one was really focusing on that, but rather they were focusing, we were focusing on the delivery and on the services that we had um, uh, at that point of time. And as the last but not the least one, we had problems with the keeping up the morale up and also the burnout of the employees. As you may um, uh, conclude, we had a lot of people having a lot of things to do um, and some of them really got into the burnout zone, which is quite bad. We weren't a, 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 aware of that until it really happened. So practically we had uh, several people uh, that uh, gave them resign zone so practically that uh, left the company and it, it really happened that we almost lost the whole team because of the burnout so practically a lot of really huge problems that we had within this uh, two years of development 
uh, that we couldn't anticipate because we weren't a product development company. We were a company of data science and big data enthusiasts that would like to focus on product development. And basically, these were some of the main challenges that we had. And on the other side that we uh, set as the main priorities that we should um, address in order to uh, deliver um, reliable and stable products, but also to keep the team spirit that we had before uh, we switched to product folks. And basically, uh, what is the today's setup? So what are some of the main lessons learned that we have um, obtained within this process, which was pretty painful for us because we didn't know how to do things right. We were like trial, trial and errors approach, right? Uh, but I really like this company because when the problem happens, we perform, um, so to say, we, sit, we all sit down from the leadership community team and we analyze what the problems are and how we can address them. And basically, how do we do this today? So we have dedicated teams for different product packages. So within uh, the company, we have uh, two, uh, let's say, main um, uh, vertical lines. So one is the delivery line and one is the product development. And within the product development, we have dedicated teams for different product packages. So we have a team only dealing with the customer data platform with building the profile studio another team building a uh, forecast engine, another team building a uh, process mining engine, etc. So practically we are setting the focuses and um, uh, let's say um, uh, creating the dedicated uh, teams for uh, uh, different functionalities within the product. Uh, we also have uh, these two vertical lines that I already mentioned. So within the delivery of the product, we are having teams focused on solutions and also focused on product delivery. So the teams within ThinkSolver, they know what their uh, role is and what their responsibilities are. And practically, uh, this, is, this was the most important thing uh, in order to prevent the burnout and also to create some, uh, let's say, all, more organized workflow. Uh, the change is that we are not expecting from one, per one person to do everything. Now they have their focus and they know what their responsibilities are. We also learned to um, celebrate the small victories and incremental releases. So after each sprint, we are like having, um, so to say, solvers, small victories, where we are, we are really uh, the improvements that we have implemented. Uh, besides this documentation first mindset, so uh, we had a lot of guerrilla development implemented before, and we learned that we have no, or we have poor documentation. So now our focus is that if we need to build some functionality or we need to build some API, we first need to create a documentation for that. So now we have a product manager and we have uh, platform manager and we have a uh, product development uh, manager. So three people dealing with this, let's say, um, roadmap planning uh, while, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, it was everything in only one person. So it was too much for one person. Another side, friendly customers and early adopters set up. So uh, we have identified the clients that could be potentially good candidates to test our platform, our product with. And it was quite important for us because we know that at first when we create something, it will not for sure, I don't know, um, be the right thing or um, uh, work properly. And it is good to have someone uh, who is aware of that and who is willing to take risks, but on the other side, gain uh, much uh, by testing our platform together with us. And to also uh, set a client into focus. So to engage the client within this process, to show um, uh, to the client what he can obtain if uh, he uh, trusts us and also trust the platform. So what are uh, some of the main actions that we've taken? So we were crystallizing the roles and responsibilities of the teams and uh, each specific employee. 
uh, we are trying to boost and keep the morale up by uh, team uh, organizing team buildings and also celebrating the small victories and incremental releases that we have. We have identified clients that are early adapters that really understand our way of work. Um, we also uh, implemented road roadmap review based on the feedback loops for our from our early adapter clients. So basically, we are tweaking the roadmap based on what the clients are saying and what the, their needs are. So now we don't have this, uh, let's say, uh, confrontation between the roadmap and the client. We are let's say, um, synchronizing this up. And uh, we have trainings and education, this customer success management process. So we are educating our clients on how they can use our platform and also um, gain the, the most out of it. So we are uh, having uh, people from our side who are working closely with the clients using our platform in order uh, to uh, gain the most out of it. And practically, that's all, folks. Uh, now uh, it is time for questions. I will be happy to answer everything that maybe you have on mind and to discuss a little bit with you guys. Hey, Valentina. Thanks Hello. for the talk. We have another question from Anders. Thanks, <laughs> for the Thanks for your presentation. We're going to try to create a product for the first time in the use of data science. So it's great to hear your story. Is there any advice that you want to give me? I think there are a lot of advice in your slides and it's possible to get them. <laughs> yes, so good luck at first. Um, yeah, create focused teams and do not require from one person to do everything. So uh, you need uh, a DevOps engineer, you really need him. Uh, you need a data engineer in order to create a pipeline and take the data and you need machine learning engineer or data scientist in order to build predictive models and also developers so back-end developers and front-end developers these are the let's say five ro roles that we have and that you also should have in order to have this end-to-end -end process so you cannot expect everything from one person that's one of the maybe most important advices and also to have this roadmap um, tweaking based on the client needs. So you really need to listen to the client in order to really fit your product uh, for this needs. Okay, cool. If you, uh, if for follow-ups on that question, you can use the platform as well. Yes, um, that's right. Pavel asked as well, uh, thank you for your talk. Mm -hmm. It's not a secret, what is your product stack? Yeah, uh, so you mean like technology stack, I suppose. I assume as well. Yeah, uh, so practically we are building everything in Python for data science and uh, data engineering. Uh, we are using AWS for a cloud platform for on cloud uh, solution. We are using Kubernetes and Docker for microservices. And uh, yeah, that's mainly it uh, from uh, databases. We are using Postgres, Elasticsearch, um, a little bit of Redis, and that's it. We've also tested our RangoDB and we created our own database, SolverDB, which is key value database. But now we are, uh, let's say, in, in the transition phase, we want to replace this SolverDB with some another, uh, other database. <laughs> there was a good list. Yeah, you have to innovate today. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. In pains um, working in a startup. So next up, um, if certain team focuses only on specific product, how do you address people risks? Mm, people with certain knowledge leaving the team, for example. Yes, that was our problem as well. Documentation and reproducibility. So you have to have documentation of everything because, yeah, we were like kidding within uh, our firm that our, our company that if someone I know uh, has some accident or something like that, mm -hmm. we will, uh, let's say, uh, have a, a really breaking out. But uh, yeah, documentation and reprodu reproducibility of all the processes, research processes and development processes. So research processes as well. You need to, let's say, document what you are researching, the uh, articles, the scientific papers, the implementations. So if you have this, you're safe and sound. Coming back to the uh, earlier question about your tech stack, how do you save these documents? Uh, yes, we are using Confluence. Uh, so uh, Atlassian a solution for documentation at the moment. We are not quite uh, sure if it is the right one, but now we are using Confluence and we are also using Bitbucket and Jira for development process. Very relatable. 
Um, question, we're running shortly out of, oh, more questions. If certain team focuses only on a specific product, how do you address people risk? No, we already got that, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how do you keep product as a product and not a solution? Meaning that when you listen too much to clients, Yes. And yeah. also very yeah. later. Yes, go for it. Yeah, it was quite problematic for us as well because we were listening to one client and it was like, can you re also replicate this to our other clients? And we're like, well, not quite really. And then our product manager says, okay, that's a service. We, we're going to set the price for this service as a specific one and we will offer this as a service. And yeah, if the client accepts, that's it. If not, we will not, let's say, make this as a candidate to enter the product if it is not general purpose or, or if it cannot be replicated within several uh, domains or within several uh, clients. So practically, we are building this product for uh, retail, e-commerce, and finance in general. But we are also thinking if we, if we can build it for telco as well. So oh. if it is too much, too specific, that is a service and it has a special price, which is much more higher than the product one. <laughs> Speaking with a lot of experience, Valentina, amazing talk. Uh, I think there are a lot of more questions coming up to you on the platform as well. I'll yes, follow. you can write me on LinkedIn, guys. I have, so you have my name here, Valentina at ThinkSolver is my mail. So we can yeah, continue with the discussion over there. Perfect. Follow up, but for now we'll end it. Uh, thank you very much and looking forward to the next session. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye and great conference. Good energy. Oh.